and so many things that he had said, I used some of the same scriptures not knowing that he had used them. So praise God. Turn, the, turn to the person next to you and say, I'm glad we are part of the same bunch. <laughs> and if you saw Brother Ron's message from last week, you would know what I'm talking about. He had his lunchbox up here, and he pulled out his grapes and showed us how they are stuck to the vine. <laughs> None of them fell off. <laughs> um, on the way home, the kids were chuckling about the fern and coming out of the pot, but... Yeah, <laughs> but I am glad that we are part of the same bunch. I, every time I come up here, I make sure that I express how much I love this house and love the people in this house. Um, and that is something, oh, thank you. And that is something that the Lord has just birthed inside of me, is to love this house, come hell or high water. <laughs> And this message today is something that the Lord has been birthing in my heart for a while. And I am nervous to bring it. (laughs) Because when you come up here, there is a responsibility. And you don't want, it is never anyone's intent to offend anyone when they come behind the pulpit. You want to speak the words that the Lord, that you're hearing from the Lord. And um, one of the um, things that was said to me and Brother Ed on our wedding day is that we were called to, and they use Brother Ed's word, edify the house of the Lord. (laughs) And so that is what I am praying that this word does for us today, is really edify the house of the Lord. And I have a little bit of a warning. And I thought about really our young people when I was when I was giving this, and I, when, I, when I say young people, I think of uh, teens, older teens, and into your 30s. Um, they have lived in the age of social media, and social media has kind of sculpted some of our thought process, intentionally or unintentionally, but the world is using it to try to shape our minds and and here's the truth it's try it's using it to try to shape our minds and it's using it to plant some lies <laughs> and we should continually pray for the people that their eyes remain open to what is actually happening so i see this in social media posts in movies in commercials our society claims to be promoting love while the undercurrent stems from hurt and unforgiveness. And if you think about some of the political movements that I'm not going to name, they want to promote love, but the underlying issues are hurt and unforgiveness. I urge you to be careful of what you read. Ensure the helmet of salvation is firmly strapped to your head and do not take it off. In fact, put on the whole armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace and the shield of faith, helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. And so we're going to go to Ephesians 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, breathe strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principles, against powers, against rulers of this dark age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And I laughed because you said that (laughs) on last Thursday. When you've done all to stand, stand. I don't want to focus too much on the enemy. We all know that he's been defeated. But there are things in this dark hour trying to warp our minds. I think sometimes 
that we're so used to reading, like scrolling through our posts or whatever it is, Instagram, YouTube, whatever it is, and we're like, you get like these like uh, positive quotes or life messages, and some of them are phenomenal, and they line up with the word of God, and they're great. And then other ones <laughs> have this underlying like, wait a second here, that's not quite right. So I think it's safe to say that some of those life quotes don't, are not the word of God, right? <laughs> But they still have power. They're still words, and they still have the power to shape our mind and say, oh, maybe, maybe that, what that says is actually right. Maybe it's actually good, right? And so that's what, I, that's what is happening in this hour. Things that seem okay, they're not that good. <laughs> they are making you believe in a doctrine or a thought process that is not quite right, there is a really enticing word being preached against younger cr crowds of Christians. And honestly, I'm leery to even address this issue because it is not my uh, intent, and I'm going to say this one more time, to upset anyone. But it has been on my heart for a long time. I hear a lot of younger preachers creating this message around church hurt. Church hurt, and yep, and I've heard an entire messages preached on this one topic. These two words put together are meant to tear down. They are not meant to build up the house of God. These two words put together focus on a problem and not the solution. What I have to say tonight is 100% foundational. You know every single thing that I'm about to say before I even say it. But I urge you to search it out for yourself if you question anything that I say tonight. Go back to the word. So the title of my message is God Created an Overcoming Company, The Power of Forgiveness. So I want to deal with forgiveness tonight. Forgiveness is the foundation of our faith. When we come to Christ, it is because we recognize Jesus the person. We recognize he forgave us for everything. We recognize his love for us, that we needed a savior, and he is the one. He forgave us for everything. Yes. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? The last song we sang, and if you walk in freedom, and if you bear his name, <laughs> yeah, that's what he did. That's what he did on the cross. It's so good. It's so good. We don't have to live where we lived before because we have a freedom. Now let's talk for a moment about hurt. Now, this, this word stirs up lots of emotions when you say it, right? Hurt, the word hurt. Some of us think about the deepest, darkest thing that ever happened to us, those deep cuts, those deep wounds. So I started with the definition. Hurt, to cause emotional pain or anguish to offend. The emotional response to hurt, and this, is, this was just so interesting. So these are from health studies. The emotional response to hurt is anxiety, fear, anger, guilt, and frustration. It can even cause depression. Holding on to hurt allows that person or situation to hurt you over and over again. If you hold on to her or hold on to a specific situation, you're basically replaying that situation over in your mind again and again. And you are then causing your own prison over and over and over again because you're allowing that situation to hurt you. And you give them that power, that situation. You give it that power. You give away the power that the Lord has given you 
to that situation. Many people respond to hurt by seeking retaliation, right? So that's the like, and if you've ever been hurt, you know what I'm talking about, because you're like, why did that happen? Why, why me, Lord? Like, they should be punished. I'm hurt, they should be punished. But that is not what the word of the Lord says at all. Um, and I'm going to go to a Leviticus 19:18. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And as I got into this word about forgiveness, I realized that it's actually a command of God. He commanded us to do this. And so if I want to continue to walk in him and for him, I have to do this because I, I need to be an obedient child. Pause for just a moment. My laptop uh, decided that it didn't want to work with me right now. And if you're dealing with hurt and it's something, it's a really hard thing, right? Some of them are really deep. And, and I have compassion if you're, because the only reason I can bring this word is because I went through it, right? And so if you're dealing with something that really, really hurts you, you've got to give it to the Lord. Whatever it is, you have got to give it to him. And if you can't, you have got to search the scripture. I'm telling you, if you get in the word, he will get into those places that you don't think you can do, and he will do the thing that only he can. So some of us are, might be thinking, what about the hard things? Hurts that are so deep they seem impossible to let go of. And I'm going to use an example of my own. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, my parents got divorced when I was 12, and my dad was not always present in my life after that. That's a big hurt, right? It's a big hurt for someone to walk out of your life that is supposed to love and care for you no matter what. The first thought that came to my mind is, do, when I think about the hurt that my dad caused, I was like, do you not love me enough to stay? Do you not love me enough to stay? Did I do something wrong? <laughs> so the reason I even bring this up is because <laughs> my dad has been coming to the house a lot. <laughs> and he's been hanging out a lot and he's come to the kids birthday parties and he's been at every holiday and I'm and it's a very strange thing for me <laughs> it's a very strange thing so this year I was like okay we always have a Father's Day picnic I'm gonna invite him over for Father's Day do you know how hard it is to pick out a Hallmark card in my situation I'm going to tell you how hard it is. So Sage and I are standing in the Hallmark aisle. I pick up the first card, and it reads, Thank you, Dad, for being there. Okay, put that one back in there. The next one is, take that one out. It says, To the best dad ever. Okay, that, that one's not going to work either. We're going to put that one back in there too. Okay, so after reading about 20 cards, Sage found the one that made fart noises. And I said, that's the one, that's the one that I'm going to give him. <laughs> Just a little humor. But the truth is that my dad is showing signs of regret and that he wants to be part of our lives even now that I'm older. And I have a choice now, right? I have a choice whether I want to rebuild that relationship or push him away. And here's the truth. I have to 
lean on the word of God and what the command of God is. And he wants me to fully forgive him. And so here I am. (laughs) And you know what? The Lord is doing something. And I'd ask you all to pray, right? I'd ask you all to pray because the Lord is really doing something here. Um, So after I was in the Hallmark aisle, this was my thought process. Sometimes we don't know what to say when someone hurts us. We don't have the words. They're not pre-written. They're not. But him wanting to spend time with me made enough of a difference to start to heal that hurt. Turn the person next to you and say, I need you. I need you. (laughs) And here's the truth, you do. So this is going to be a total bunny trail, but I think it's a great story. Okay, so put forgiveness on hold for a minute. Um, We went over to uh, Nick and Liz's house to give them some food while they were home with their newborn son, and we had a wonderful time. And before we went over there, our air conditioning broke in the middle of a heat wave. And we actually spent two nights in our camper (laughs) because there was AC in there. So back to Nick and Liz's house. We were there. We were fellowshipping. We were having a good time. And Ed's telling Nikita about our thermostat and how that is actually the issue of why the air conditioning didn't work. And Nikita said, I think I have what you need. I think I have what you need. And so he went down to the basement, brought this thermostat back up. We went back home, and sure enough, that thermostat worked and fixed the whole system on the, in the air conditioning system. Your brother and sister in Christ might have exactly what you need. But if you do not spend time with that person, if we never stopped to go over to Nick and Liz's house, we would have never known that they had exactly what we needed. (laughs) It's so, it's so amazing. And you know, here, I'm not laying guilt on anybody. We live in a time where we are busier than ever before. We are running around like crazy. You know, inflation is going up, money is getting tight, stress, anxiety want to creep in wherever they can. But we need to make fellowship even more of a priority. Okay? Because here's the thing, I don't want to miss out on what you have to give. And I don't want to miss out on giving you, I may have something you need. And I don't want to miss that opportunity. So back to forgiveness. So the answer to every hurt is always forgiveness. The answer to every offense is always forgiveness. And here's the tough one, and I really speak to those in the house who have grown up in this, in this house. Because we teach our kids love, we teach them forgiveness, we teach them foundation, And then what happens is as they grow, they tend to look around and see all of the mistakes that we have made. And it causes unbelief. Well, I don't want to act like that. (laughs) Why would I I believe what they believe? Look at the way they treat one another, right? Forgiveness is always the answer. Sage and Lucas, if there's anything that I teach you to, it is to forgive. Forgive everyone for everything. There are going to be people in here that mess up for you guys. They're going to mess up and you might get hurt. But guess what? You're going to learn to walk in forgiveness. Then Peter came up to him. Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I will forgive him? 
as many as, as many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. That is so many times. And, and the worship team, you've already heard some of this. But it's really, really on my heart. I have to forgive you over and over and over again. And those of you that have lasted 40 years in this house, congratulations. Because <laughs> you've learned. You've learned that you have to do this to endure. Luke 17, 1. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. Isn't that the truth? Also, to those who grow up in the house, there are these two items that kind of get mixed up together. And one of them is condemnation, and the other thing is conviction, okay? Condemnation and conviction deliver the same emotional response, and that is pain. So if you hear something over the pulpit, and uh, it, you know it's the truth, but it stings just a little bit, right? It's like, ugh. Or if someone in leadership comes and asks you to do something. <laughs> and it, that's not quite the same thing. That's more obedience. But I want to deal with condemnation and conviction. They feel the same sometimes. And you need the Holy Spirit to divide the two. So condemnation, the difference between the two, condemnation is someone is a rejection, like is a negative thing. It is a very strong disapproval. Conviction by the Holy Spirit causes you to feel bad about a sin you committed or you feel disturbed about something you should have done but you did not do. Okay? So there is a difference between the two. Many people sit in church and they hear a word and they're like, you're judging me. And it's like, no, we are preaching the word of the Lord, and I'm sorry that you have interpreted it that way and that it is causing you pain, but I am not condemning you by any means. Right? So we talked about the emotional response to hurt. Let's talk about the emotional response to forgiveness. Um, and this comes out of the power of forgiveness by Harvard Health. Forgiveness is associated with lower levels of depression, anxiety, and hostility. Reduced substance abuse, higher self-esteem, and a greater life satisfaction. It sounds like forgiveness brings life. <laughs> Absolutely, it, it produces the fruits of the Spirit. Forgiveness. Okay, Matthew 18, verses 21, and actually there's a lot here. We're going to start with 21. Then Peter, oh, you know what, did I already read this? I did. There is a, um, also a verse of scripture, and I'm sorry that I can't find scripture and verse at the moment, um, that talks about a uh, master and a servant. 
and the servant came to his master and pleaded for forgiveness on a debt he was owed. And because the servant came and pleaded, the master gave him mercy. Then that servant turned around and there was someone else that owed him money. And instead of forgiving the debt, he, went and he wanted to get, uh, put revenge on this person, it says he even laid hands on him, and then threw him in jail. The master found out and said, I showed you mercy. How could you not show this man mercy when he owed you money? And the end of that scripture says, and again, for, I say this again, forgiveness is a, a command of God. So my heavenly Father will also do to each of you from his heart if you do not forgive your brother. So you got to forgive others because it says clearly that he's not going to forgive you if you don't forgive those around him. Forgiveness is a command from the Lord and an action by his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Okay, and I'm going to read for a little bit Luke 23, 32 through 43. What Jesus did on the cross was the ultimate sacrifice. He showed us exactly how we were supposed to forgive. There were also two others. Criminals led him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They don't know what they do. How can you say that? Can you imagine the love of God? Can you imagine that? They beat him. They bruised him. They made him carry a cross uphill. And then they crucified him. And he said the words that are so hard for us to say. Father God, forgive them because they don't know. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them snared, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers mocked him, coming out, offering him sour wine, saying, If you are king of the Jews, save yourself. And on an inspect, uh, inscription was also written over him, letters in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, You are Christ, save, us, save yourself and us. But the other answer, answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong? Then he said, Jesus Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I can't. I can't even fathom. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't, he didn't deserve what he got. He was totally blameless. He was begotten. They did so much to him. And the things he said on that hill. <laughs> Can you even fathom? They beat him and bruised him, and he didn't do anything wrong. But in the midst of it all, he forgave the whole world for every offense and then asked us to do the same thing. He called us to be an overcoming company of people, to move past hurt, to press on towards forgiveness, and on to an abundant life with him.
I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. Acts 26, 18. Jesus is telling Paul what his calling is. And he's saying this to Paul, and he says, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul's calling was great. He was called to great works, but he was called to a life of persecution. It is very clear that when you look at Paul's life, it was determined, he was a determined and passionate individual. Determined and passionate. Determined is having a mind that is firm on decision, being resolved not to change it. If we are determined, we are passionate about our goal, and we are willing to do or go through almost anything to achieve it. The Lord is calling a people to renew their determination in this hour. He is asking every single one of us to have determination and passion for his purpose. Philippians 3, 12 through 15, and we all know this scripture. (laughs) Not that I have already attained or I am already perfect, but I press, I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself apprehended, but but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching towards for the things that are ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward calling of Jesus Christ. Let us there, therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, then God is going to reveal it to you. Jesus. To press, to press, to press, move or cause to move into a position of contact with something. Brother Ron, you said this on Thursday night, to exert. You have to do something when you press, when you press. We must have a determination and a passion for the call that God has on our lives. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and let the sin which so easily ensnares us And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. (laughs) This is so exciting. It is so exciting. It is not meant to be heavy. But he has traded your hurt for forgiveness. And he is calling us to walk in that. And I got to tell you, for the past two to three years, the Lord has been dealing with me about this. And I now do not take easily offense to things people say or do. Instead, I step back, I take a breath, I say, is what they're saying truth? Because I want to make sure it's not conviction that's coming over me instead of condemnation. I think about what is being said, and if it is meant to hurt, I forgive it instantly, and then keep walking. Because here's the truth. He is calling us to a higher realm, to a higher place in him. Don't let hurt stop you from fulfilling the call of God on your life. Don't let the world or false teaching trap your mind into looking at the problem instead of the solution. Walk in love and forgiveness always. 
I heard one woman say that she predetermines in her mind every morning as she wakes up that she is going to forgive any offense that comes her way before the day even unfolds. (laughs) This is walking it out. This is where the Lord wants you to be. This is what it looks like because when you are determined that you are going to forgive no matter what, you keep the victory and the enemy remains defeated because you're no longer allowing any hurts to come. You're just walking in victory. You've predetermined in your heart that you are going to walk this thing out. God knew from the beginning that Jesus was going to have to come. <laughs> you got you to get this, right? He wants us to wake up every morning and forgive every offense before it comes. In the beginning, there was a meeting. And in that meeting, he planned everything. Before you ever got here, he said, I am going to forgive them because he knew Adam was going to fall And we want to know what this looks like in shoe leather. Wake up every morning with forgiveness in your heart. This is the last scripture I have tonight. Ephesians 1, 15 through 18. Therefore, I also... After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks to you for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is hope, what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in all the saints? And that's all I have tonight.